So thank you for joining us today. For those who don't know me, um, I'm Darlene McLennan. And I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training, or ADSET for short. Um, really excited to be having this webinar. It's a topic that I know many have asked for, um, and we've done a number of webinars and we've developed a range of content um, on our website as well. Um, just some housekeeping before we start. So this webinar is being live captioned. To activate those captions, you can click on the um, CC button either at the bottom or the top of your screen. Um, and we also have captions in the browser and we'll put the link in now into the chat so you can access the captions through your browser. I'm on Butchawitta, Tasmanian's Aboriginal land, and in the spirit of reconciliation, ADSET and myself respectfully acknowledges the Luchawida nations and also recognise Aboriginal history and culture of the land. And I want to pay my respects to elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people who did not make elder status. I also want to acknowledge all the countries participating in this meeting and also acknowledge their elders and ancestors and the legacy to us and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. I invite you, if you haven't been with us before, and I'm already saying people are doing it, invite you to put into the chat on the country that you are today as a show of respect. Okay, um, just a couple of other, so the webinar today is Autistic Student Experiences of University in Australia, and that's presented by Dr. Diana Tan and Marion Rambuka. This explores the autistic students' experiences when enrolling and attending university. And they'll also cover recommendations for creating a neurodiverse affirming or neuroaffirming environment for students at university. Um, just a couple of other housekeeping um, details. As I said, this um, session is being captioned by the wonderful Helen from Bradley Reporting and will be recorded. The session will be added to ADSET in the coming days. If you are having any technical difficulties, you can email us at admin at adset.edu.au. Um, Marion and Diana will talk um, for around 50 minutes and then we'll, we'll um, go over to questions. I invite you to add in the questions you have into the Q&A box. That's where I will take those questions from, um, but also encourage you to chat with each other or chat with us in the chat box, which is just general. But if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the presenters, please pat, um, put that into the Q&A box. Well, that's it for me. I will see you at the end of the presentation and now I'll hand over to Diana to make a start. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, darling. Um, and at set for inviting Marion and I to present our work. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Walla Madagal people and um, the beautiful Darug land where my family and I live, play and work and where the bulk of this work was produced. Um, I extend my respect to elders past and present and emerging and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples here with us today. Um, I'm Diana, I have my camera on and I think you can see me. I'm a Southeast Asian woman with black shoulder length hair and light brown skin. I'm wearing a pair of gray rimmed glasses and navy colored um, blouse with white polka dots. Um, so here's the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to first provide some background information um, which should help you understand why we think this area of research is important. Um, in this work, we address two research aims. I will talk about the first research aim and how we went about conducting this research. Marin will then take over and share our findings from addressing the first research aim. I will then um, talk about the second research aim, discuss some preliminary results and some general discussion. I thought I should also add a content warning for this talk as we are going to be sharing some first-hand accounts of autistic students' experiences of discrimination and stigma at universities. So please feel free to do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. We'll start with a little bit of a background. In Australia, there are key policies such as the Fair Chance for All policy introduced in 1991 and the Disability Dis Discrimination Act in 1992 that sought to protect the rights of um, people with disabilities, including their rights to inclusive education. It has been suggested that the introduction of these policies have directly led to a tenfold increase in the number of disabled students enrolling into universities in the last 30 years. 
While this is an encouraging trend, a closer look at disabled students' completion rates and experiences at universities suggests that higher education remains inaccessible. Take autistic people as an example. Compared to people with other forms of disability, we know that autistic people are twice less likely to hold a bachelor degree or higher. And compared to people without disability, autistic people are four times less likely to hold a degree. What these statistics tell us is while policy changes have led to more students enroll, um, enrolling from this population, there is so much more that needs to be done to keep them at universities, to be successful, to have a good time at universities. Many studies have made some progress into understanding the barriers faced by autistic students at universities and factors that impeded them from being successful. Many autistic students felt a deep sense of otherness and struggled to deal with other people's um, stereotype beliefs about autism and autistic people. There is also a lack of understanding and awareness about autism and autistic people, which sometimes lead to a lack of appropriate support and accommodations. Crucially, many autistic students reported a fear of discrimination, hence have felt unsafe to disclose their autistic identity. This further prevented them from accessing support services. The recent Senate inquiry into the services, support and life outcomes of autistic Australians also highlighted this issue in a section of findings on autistic students' experiences of higher education. A parent of one autistic person said, quote, his life at university has been impacted by his refusal to tell the university that he is autistic. He feels that it would single him out and expose him to the same bullying that he experienced at high school. All of these works led us to conceptualize our first research aim. From previous research findings, we know that autistic university students experiences um, stigma and discrimination in higher education, and this occur, um, this this occur really regularly, and it's really highly prevalent. But there hasn't been any studies that delves into the context and circumstances in which these experiences occur. So the first aim of our research um, wants to address this issue, because such experiences are nuanced and context dependent. We chose to use a qualitative approach to address this aim. I'm going to now talk about our method in approaching this research question. So we advertised our study on social media in November, 2021, where we invited autistic people who are above um, 18 years of age. They use English and were formally diagnosed or self-identified as autistic. And they had prior experience with university. And this included graduates, current students, and those who discontinued. 21 autistic people completed their interviews with us. At the time of the study, they were between 23 and 56 years old, mostly domestic students and mostly women. Half, um, about half of them identified as autistic before or during university, and about half were current students. Interviews were conducted one-on-one -on -one in a semi-structured format. Participants were given many choices in how they want to complete their interviews, including a choice between an autistic or a non-autistic interviewer, and interview formats, including video conferences on Zoom, phone call, email, or live text messaging. Our interviews covered five key topics on our participants' experiences with their autism diagnosis or self-identification, transitions into university, interactions with their peers, academic and professional staff, and navigating the university system. During our discussion, we avoided any terms related to discrimination and only delved into these topics when participants brought them up. This is to avoid asking leading questions, which may influence the way participants responded to the question. Transcripts were analyzed using Brown and Clark's recommendations for conducting reflexive thematic analyses. So this uses a data-driven approach, free of any prior expectations, which allows us to use participants' own narratives to address our research question. Our research also adopted a participatory approach where autistic and non-autistic researchers work together and share decision-making power at every step of this research. This includes its conceptualization, design, analysis, and dissemination. 
I will now hand over to Marion, who will share findings from this study. Marion. Sorry, Marion, you're... Um... <laughs> I don't even have to I'm say sorry, it, I'm I? mute. It started well. <laughs> okay, okay, leave anyway, me with it. I will start again. I'm Marion. I have my camera on. Um, I'm a white Anglo woman in my 50s with light brown and silver streaked hair. It's tied back and I'm wearing um, purple rimmed glasses and I have on a dark teal jumper. Okay, so from our analysis, we felt that participants' experiences of discrimination could be described in four themes and nine sub-themes. In a flow chart shown here, the top row consists of four boxes representing, sorry, sorry, four boxes filled in maroon colour representing the four main themes. The subsequent rows consist of boxes filled in white colour, three underneath the first theme, two underneath themes two to four, representing this, the nine sub-themes. I'll be pre presenting some quotes representing each theme and sub-theme in the next few slides. Okay, the first theme reinforces what many previous studies have shown, that autistic people's disability is something that people don't have a clue about. Our first sub-theme describes how many autistic people felt profoundly, profoundly misunderstood, particularly by university support services, which, quote, have very poor understanding of how autism affects capacity and how we approach university tasks. Our second sub-theme describes our participants' fear of not being believed. Our analysis revealed that this fear was not unfounded. Upon disclosing being autistic, one participant was told that, quote, I would not make a very good teacher and that I should probably not continue with my course. Another participant who was an autistic autism researcher shared her experiences of applying for ethics approval for their study. I felt like I had to prove more because I was seen as a potential harm because of the fact that I'm autistic, as in how can I be trusted to understand when someone is distressed? Our third sub-theme describes how many of these experiences are compounded by other marginalised identities. Some participants also have, for example, one participant who was, uh, sorry, for example, one participant who was a migrant said to us, my history is complicated as an autistic person by also being half Italian. When I went to uni, I actually had people say how exotic it was that I was there. So some of the stuff is hard to pull apart from getting an extra set of messages that I don't didn't deserve, that didn't deserve to be there, that I didn't deserve to be there anyway. Sorry. Okay. The second theme was based around uh, the inaccessibility at universities. There were two sub themes. First, besides the inhospitable built environment within universities, our participants felt that access to support services was paradoxically difficult. University processes that are meant to help autistic students were described as a massive bureaucracy with lots of hoops to jump through and a million forms that you need to fill out. The entire system has been described by a participant as symbolic violence, a deliberate process to make people like me give up. The second sub-theme highlights the unequal power dynamic within the academic establishment. Oftentimes, our participants would go through the arduous process of getting support and having their individual learning plans approved by disability services, but then lecturers have the discretion as to whether or not they implement these plans. One participant shared a harrowing experience of having their accommodation request denied by a lecturer. A lecturer said, she doesn't want any adjustments for students with disabilities. And also she said she got lots of emails from Access and Inclusion that I was struggling with a course. But she said, when I got those emails, I didn't trust those emails because you didn't look like you were struggling in my course. You need so much, you didn't need so much support. You should be more confident with yourself. Though the truth was I needed support, but she refused to implement adjustments for the entire semester. The third theme focuses on the onus being on autistic students. There were two sub-themes. First, many students had to really advocate for their own support needs. Autistic students had to keep pushing for what they need until, it's, until it resolves, to continue, continuously ask for support, and even to prove your worthiness as a disabled person to get those supports. One participant described, quote, this is the sort of thing they're saying. We help all people 
we like diversity and all that. That's complete bullshit. You expect a person who's from the minority to do all of the work and what are you actually giving them in return or giving in return? Okay, the second sub theme fo focuses on the costs of advocacy. While many autistic students were proud of their advocacy skills, they came at a cost. Many participants shared the emotional burden of such advocacy, which impacts on one's dignity, that somehow it's a failure to ask for help. One participant perceived, perceives this to be stigma that a lot of people carry and have internalized around disability services because they've internalized the shame of disability for whatever reason. The fourth theme focuses on how getting through university was a matter of grit and stubbornness. There were two sub themes. Many participants attempted university several times. Through these experiences, they felt that they had a better understanding of how I work, learned a little bit more about what I can and can't do, and recognize when things are getting too much and drew boundaries. But this is all a very expensive, expensive lesson to learn. The second sub theme describes how some autistic students cared and advocated for other marginalized students. Despite the toll that advocacy could take, many participants provided peer support or peer mentoring, founded inclusive spaces like Pride Society, developed disability ally training, and sat on academic boards to influence higher education policies. Okay. Our paper is now published in the journal Autism. Shown on the right hand side of the slide is a screen capture of our paper. Our paper is free to access from the URL shown on the slide. Um, and I believe it's also been put into the chat for access. So now I'll hand over to Diana to talk about the second research aim. Thanks, Marion. Um, I will now talk us through the second research aim. In light of the results from Research aim one, and given the richness of our data, I think um, most of our participants talked to us for over an hour. So that gives us that has given us a lot of rich and um, and a wealth of data from from the transcript. So we were able to ask additional research questions from the same transcripts, um, and we asked two more questions. First, in the first study, we we know that many autistic students felt that people don't have a good understanding of how they approach university. So I wanted to ask the question, how do autistic students approach universities? We then asked, uh, asked a further question of how universities can better support autistic students' ways of learning. So these are the results from our pre preliminary analyses. They are not finalized yet, so, um, so just bear with me. From our analysis, we felt that the research questions can be addressed in four main themes and 10 sub-themes. In a flow chart shown on this slide, the top row has four boxes filled in maroon color representing the four main themes. The subsequent rows consist of boxes filled in white color with three underneath the first and third theme and two underneath the second and fourth theme, and these represents the sub-themes. I will be talking through each theme and sub-theme in detail over the next few slides. The first theme describes how autistic participants had to fight really hard to get through life in and outside of uni. There are three sub-themes related to this. First, many, many participants have, have, have had a rough life. Um, while going through universities, many were also experiencing homelessness living in unsafe situations, dealing with harassment and discrimination, and they were processing a lot of trauma from childhood around that time. Many entered university from a high school experience that was pretty horrific, where they weren't accepted into any friendship circles and were chronically bullied. All of these experiences affected the way autistic students engaged with university. The second sub-theme talks about how universities can be a sensory nightmare for many autistic students, many of whom experienced so much difficulty around class sizes and lecture halls with so many people and so many smells. 
so much so that they could not process the auditory stuff or hear what the lecturers are saying. They just couldn't be in that space. For exams in particular, students found that smaller locations were better for one participant who wasn't given the accommodation she needed. Her grade, quote, wasn't a reflection of my ability. It was a reflection of my intense anxiety when I'm in a bad sensory environment. The third sub-theme describes how autistic students process information differently. Quite often, our participants found that there was no processing time, even though it takes them longer to process things. One participant described this issue really well. Quote, I am a good student, not despite the fact that I'm autistic. It's because I'm autistic. The hyper-focus and just the attention to detail, organization skills, these things make me a good student. But at the same time, the poor working memory, the inability to get instructions, the social stuff, the networking stuff, all of that stuff I can't do. It doesn't make sense against this thing that seems really academic. To compensate for these processing differences, often without much support, many autistic students felt that they spent so much time covering up these challenges that other people always see the high achiever, but none of them ever saw the burnout. They don't see the work underneath. For one person, they said, quote, it takes me about 200 hours to write 2,000 words, and I'll get a HD, but it's just such a slow process. The second theme describes how autistic people took a lot longer to try and make sense of the system than other people. There were two sub-themes related to this. First, autistic students felt that once you hit uni, you're on your own. Like most students, many autistic students initially felt excited about going to universities as they saw it as, quote, an opportunity to reinvent myself. But their transition into university life was described as really difficult. They felt like they were on their own to figure out what's the norm in a completely different environment and form of studies to school. And often without any good frame of reference for what you're supposed to do, especially for those who are doing universities for the first time. Importantly for many participants, quote, it was not only the transition into learning environment, but it was also the transition to living independently and having to self-manage so many aspects of my life. The second sub-theme describes our participants' experiences of finding many unwritten rules at university that they didn't understand, including the expectations around teacher-student relationship, expectations from lecturers and tutors, the online portal, um, et cetera. Wayfinding was a particular issue experienced by many. One participant said, campus map didn't have any room numbers and the room numbers didn't make sense. And the different buildings have different room numbers and naming conventions. I would be an hour early to class because it's like, I have to find this room. I find it really difficult. So what can universities, what can we do about it? The third theme describes what it means to foster and then an enabling environment for autistic students. The three sub -themes relate, there are three sub-themes related to this. First, an induction into university life to address challenges with transition. Many autistic students quote, sometimes the biggest step is getting to know the people and the uni and feeling comfortable in your environment, not actually your, capabil your capability of doing the study. Some of our participants also came up with other suggestions, like, quote, an induction or a transition process where all of the ins and outs and all of the unwritten rules, that hidden curriculum stuff was explained. And also, quote, having someone showing me around initially would have been good for the wayfinding stuff in the university. The second sub-theme focuses on normalizing alternative forms of communication and assessment. For most students, flexible structures and pedagogical approaches work well. This includes priority timetable preferencing, 
offering different ways of communicating, such as phone calls, in-person meeting, online meetings, or emails. Providing information in different formats, in particular, making lecture recordings available because they allow participants to pause, rewind, and understand what the lecturers were saying. It gives us the processing time that they need. Closed captioning and transcripts were also useful because many autistic students find it easier to read. Flexi flexible marking rubric were also helpful. In the case of one participant, they were able to negotiate flexibility around marking rubrics for their presentations so that they're not unfairly marked down for certain things like body language. Ultimately, as one participant said, quote, we see the world differently, we produce differently. So having the option to present our work differently would be wonderful. The third sub theme focuses on making it okay to ask for help. Many participants didn't actually know that support services exist. Even when they knew about it, many think that there is an unspoken perception that you just don't seek those services at university. So there needs to be more efforts in promoting these services and normalizing asking for help. One participant shared a positive experience with us, quote, I had a tutor tell me that more than half of the people inside had an EAP and she herself had an EAP, and that normalized it for me and made me feel that it was okay to ask for more help. The fourth and final theme focuses on building a sense of belonging for autistic students. The first theme looks at what it means for autistic students to be afforded the freedom to just be. One student had, an, had a positive experience at a university where, quote, it was, it was built into the ethos and spirit of the school that there are lots of different people with lots of different lives and lots of different reasons and lots of different challenges. And so it was just a done thing to be understanding. This doesn't happen a lot, but when autistic people were in a neuroaffirming environment, they feel a deep sense of acceptance and lack of judgment, a sense of freedom. They were able to really thrive especially when they found people like them. For one participant, they had autistic tutors, which made them feel that university, that university got to be at least open to seeing the value of who autistic people are. The second sub-theme emphasizes the importance of individual responsibility in supporting autistic students. Some of the most positive experiences our participants describe came from lecturers who were, quote, really proactive and reaching out to me and making sure that I was okay. Lecturers who were willing to take time out to explain things to me, willing to go away and do a bit of work to understand how to support them. So it's not entirely up to autistic students to educate them. If we think about the power imbalances autistic people felt from the first study, we should be able to appreciate the power of taking individual responsibility and the effects it can have on autistic students. I will now discuss um, the findings from these studies. The findings highlight that there is a lack of autism understanding amongst non-autistic university staff and students. Naturally, the obvious solution is to improve our autism understanding. Several studies have found that, indeed, improving autism understanding amongst non-autistic university staff and students is linked to a reduction in stigmatized attitudes towards autistic students. But there is an important caveat to keep in mind. A recent study by Bonfilo and colleagues interviewed university staff in um, Scotland, I believe, about their attitudes towards inclusive education at universities to which many university staff have agreed that it is important to ensure that higher education is, is accessible for disabled students. The study authors went a step further and asked university staff to provide examples on the things that they have done to ensure accessibility, but many of them weren't able to do so. So what this study highlighted was the attitude behavior gap where attitude doesn't necessarily translate into actions or behaviors. And it is the behavior cha behavioral change that is crucial in this case. 
I think improving autism knowledge and our knowledge about other forms of neurodivergence is an important first step in our professional development. But what is really going to change things is putting knowledge into action and an ongoing reflection on our inclusive practices to evaluate whether or not our strategies are working. If possible, our neurodivergent students and colleagues need to be a part of this reflection or evaluation. Autistic students often deal with microaggressions at universities, as shown in our first study. I think this can be counteracted with microaffirmations. To affirm our autistic and otherwise neurodivergent students that they belong at universities, Patrick Dwyer um, from Lutrop University, along with several other neurodivergent scholars, have put together a brilliant set of recommendations for developing neuroaffirming universities. One recommendation that really stood out to me was to invest on neurodivergent-led initiatives and leadership. This not only embraces the value of participatory and service user-led approach, it also increases the visibility and representation of neurodivergent leaders within universities. So it is the same sort of conversation that we are having around ethnic and gender representations in higher education. We need representations from neurodivergent um, leaders as well. But I think also importantly, we need to make universities a safe place so that people can feel safe to um, reveal their autistic or neurodivergent identity to improve these representations. Our findings also show that support services are difficult to access. We need to reconsider certain requirements, um, especially mandatory requirements, um, particularly around the provision of diagnostic letters because of the barriers to getting these diagnoses, including prohibitive costs of assessments, long wait times, and poor knowledge around how autism presents in marginalized populations. Importantly, these diagnostic letters are highly personal and highly deficit focused that many autistic students do not feel comfortable sharing as they don't represent who they are as a whole. In designing these processes, we need to think about the academic pressures that autistic people face alongside the administrative burden of, access, of accessing these services, which can be exacerbated by executive dysfunctions. Universal Design for Learning is a really excellent framework for ensuring that learning materials and processes are accessible from the get-go. For example, if an autistic student only requires closed captioning, they shouldn't have to go through the entire process just to get this. If closed captioning was provided from the get-go, this could potentially free up resources to help other students with more complex requirements. Lastly, our findings suggest that many autistic students experience trauma, which affect the way they engage with universities. Self-advocacy also comes at a cost. Therefore, university and service providers could benefit from adopting a trauma-informed practice. The Blue Knot Foundation has developed an excellent guideline for this, um, specifically for people with disabilities, which I highly encourage you to check out. I believe the URL is now um, copied into the chat box. We're now working with a learning designer to refine these recommendations and we hope to provide more specific strategies around um, how we can better support autistic students in the publication to come. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, we are happy to answer them. If you only think of these questions after web, the webinar, which I often do, please feel free to email me. I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. That's fabulous. Thank you, Diana. We actually have lots of questions um, and there's been a great lot of chat um, amongst the participants, so which is wonderful. Um, so I'll probably start with um, the one that's got, um, so I encourage people to kind of upvote. So I'll start with the um, first one of, that's got four um, of the thumbs up. Was there a difference in the experiences of practitioner diagnosed autistic students with diagnostic paperwork versus self-diagnosed autistic students who didn't have the paperwork to support themselves? 
That's a great question. So amongst um, the 21 participants, one of them was self-identified. So they, want, they, they were in the process of going through um, diagnoses, but about 50% went through universities without having a diagnosis. So I would say that without um, the diagnostic paperwork, they don't get access to the support services that could otherwise help with their learnings at universities. So arguably, they had a much harder time than those with a diagnosis. But having said that, half of the students had a diagnosis and they still felt like they weren't well supported. So um, yeah, we are, there is a third installment of this series of studies where we'll be focusing on the, the experiences of those who went through universities without a diagnosis. Um, so I think um, there'll be more that we could elucidate from that third study. Is there anything else that you want to add, Marion? I was going to say, and we're talking about students who have been to university over a long period of time as well, um, given the age, like some um, participants were in their 50s and had been at university when they were a lot younger. And so access to inclusion and support services probably didn't even exist at that point in time when they were first at university. It's a challenge too, though, you know, I think all of us kind of advocating in the sector kind of come from a social model and, you know, human right model, but yet we still live in this medicalised model and diagnosis still seems to play mm. a big part. And, so. it, and my experience is it's not just um, having a diagnosis, you also have to have um, reports that outline why you know, yeah. being autistic uh, requires you to, um, to be in need of support um, and yeah. what your learning needs uh, you know how they're different as well which is um really difficult because often when people have um been through a diagnostic process um tertiary education is not the reason for doing it um and not necessarily addressed in those reports that so can be really difficult even if you have the uh, privilege of having a, a formalized diagnosis to support that process at a tertiary institution yeah, no, definitely. And yeah, like kind of what reasonable adjustments and, you know, identify with a good educational psychologist as a really powerful document, but we all know mm. it's very expensive, very hard to get to. And yeah, and, um, you know, and there's school practitioners out there that have that ability to do that with the students. So, which is fabulous. One of the other questions, um, are there plans to replicate the study to examine students with ADHD who, you know, probably have identified that have similar, similar experiences? Yeah, um, many of our participants in this study had co-occurring conditions as well. ADHD represents a huge proportion um, mm. and also other forms of neurodivergence like dyslexia, PTSD, etc. So what this study has inspired us to do is to broaden our scope to cover a wider range of the neurodivergence. So what we would do um, maybe sometime next year is to yeah, essentially what the um, question was saying to replicate this study, but covering a wider range of neurodivergence. Yeah, and, and certainly a co-occurring condition such as ADHD um, from the interview seemed to make life at university much trickier and more complex. Understandable. Um, someone wrote that looks like these interviews were done when a lot of the classes were still hybrid or online. Um, you know, we're now seeing that a lot of um, sessions are, you know, being returned to face to face and so forth. Um, so was availability of online lectures, tutorials, networking discussed by participants and was it a concern? Yeah. I actually went back to the data and had a look. So only 10 of the participants were current students when we um, did the interviews. And as I said before, we had people, you know, up into their 50s who participated and, you know, had, uh, you know, the hybrid versions or online wasn't even an option. So it was a very mixed um, group of people. Yeah, yeah, but I can distinctly, distinctively remember a few interviews that I did where participants said that they couldn't have done university if not for the online um, access yeah. to these courses. Yeah. And they were made online because of COVID. So I do worry yeah. that like with universities moving back to face-to-face -to -face and limiting online options, it would really restrict many autistic students from being able to complete universities. 
you know, that that's that's definitely accessibility yeah. issue um, in in that and, direction. And probably a choice for people to pick distance education where they can as well. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Um, did your research reveal any insights on how disability support services can, you know, a model can be created to provide supports and adjustments, especially for those who don't have a formal diagnosis? Um, I think universal design comes to mind because it essentially focuses on making things accessible as a default so then if it is made a default then people don't have to go through support services which is often difficult to access mm -hmm. um making the environment neuro affirming is another framework that comes to mind as well if we send a message to neurodivergent students that they are welcome here that we value we value having them at university then again it sends and a funding message to a neurodivergent student. As to how we go about doing that specifically, um, our team is still working on developing some um, specific guidelines to provide more um, tangible strategies on how we might go about doing that. Um, that paper that I mentioned by Patrick Dwyer, there, there are really good recommendations around um, neuroaffirming and universities on there as well. So I would really encourage you to have a look. And importantly, that work was led by neurodivergent scholars. So they know what's missing and they have really good suggestion on how to fill those gaps. Um, I'm, I've applied for funding to, to develop a proper guideline as well and to test the effectiveness of the guideline. So fingers crossed I get further funding for this work too. That'd be brilliant. And please yeah, keep us in the loop because we'd love to put that on adset and, and promote it widely. It's something that, as I said at the beginning of the webinar, um, you know, we certainly are inundated with questions and, um, yeah, people wanting to know more information and any guide that can support that is great. Um, someone's asked also around that dual, dual diagnosis of the ADHD and um, autism, so, you know, near diversity. And I think they kind of... Um, I quite liked how they write, write that, that um, the, the brain that's constantly at war with itself. Um, so was there any kind of experience or in, in the cohorts that, that um, were involved in this, was there anybody with that dual diagnosis that, um, yeah, you could talk to at all? Or? Marin, do you want to speak to this? Um, all I'd say is that, that um, having ADHD was a really common co-occurring condition um, and created additional more complex struggles, I think. Mm. Yeah. There's certainly been a little bit more research out there now um, about the the two. Um, yeah, that kind of yeah, because I think previously, I think 20 years ago, you they couldn't see that if you could you couldn't be on the autism spectrum as well as have ADHD or something, which seems mm. quite strange. Um, just I, before I think, we ask, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, I think the data is if you have one, there's a really high percentage that you have the other. The other. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just going to post a link in the chat um, that um, Diana spoke before about UDL um, and how that can play a really powerful um, part in ensuring that you're, you know, if you're a teacher or an academic or, or so forth, that your teaching should be as inclusive as possible. And often people don't need to, you know, to do, do a diagnosis if it's a flexible approach to, you know, assessments, a flexible approach to, to um, the teaching and learning. So uh, we are have hosting a UDL symposium. Um, it will be a face-to-face -face event in Melbourne, as well as an online event. I really encourage people to um, put an abstract in or, or to register for that event. Um, we're really excited. We've got Thomas Tobin coming over um, from America to speak at that. So it'll be, um, it'll be lovely to, you know, I mean, yeah, we want to make it as inclusive as possible. So the event will be um, online and face to face, but really looking forward to getting some people in the room and having some great conversations around UDL and how we can bring about, um, yeah, a more UDL lens across all the whole of the tertiary sector. Um, one of the questions we've got was, is there any quick wins you can call out from your studies um, that, you know, could help us in the processes or spaces that we have within our institutions? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I, I think relationship is everything. Putting 
putting time and investing on developing a relationship with your autistic clients or students will make a, a world of difference. So um, I would call that a quick win if people are able to put in time and invest resources into supporting autistic students. Because often, quite often, um, some of our autistic students felt that the systems are disconnected. So they go to disability services, they were told one thing, and they had to take the same thing to take their IEP, for example, um, and take that to their lecturers who had no idea about what sort of adjustments they need to make to fulfill those I, um, IEP requirements. Um, and then students find themselves having to advocate for themselves themselves multiple times because they've got different lecturers for different units. And they do that from once from semester to semester. So think about how much advocacy they have to do. And if someone's able to take, take that load of autistic students, I would say that that is a, a quick and pretty big win. Um, yeah, from that's my perspective. Marion, do you have anything I, else to add? Yeah, I was going to say, I think if you have autistic students who tell you what their needs are, then you need to listen to them. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, somebody's written, I'm a clinical facilitator of for nursing students on placements in a hospital environment. I'm trying to use UDL principles when designing support tools. Any autism specific guidance um, uh, around, yeah, kind of putting into that practice? The one thing I can think about, because I'm just thinking about a couple of students who were in that position. So they were placement students in hospital environments and sensory challenges is a huge one. Um, so making sure that their placement environment has, has a place to help them decompress in a sensory friendly environment will be really, really helpful. And mm -hmm. checking in with your placement student frequently because it gives them it gives them an opportunity to share any concerns that they have without without them taking the first step. I think I think that's mm. important. Yeah, I, I also think it's important to be um, affirming as well. Um, a number of we had a significant number of people who were in helping professions, um, and they were often told that they were unsuitable based on being autistic for their profession. Um, and I think it's really important that we do have healthcare workers and teachers and people in other healthcare and health professions, caring professions um, that are our autistic. The autistic community really needs that. Yeah, yeah. excellent. No, and, the, suppose... and the reality is workplaces are not autism friendly generally. No. So, um, you know, they will need additional support. Yeah, I've pasted two links into the chat. One was around a report that was done a number of years ago now, it feels like just like yesterday, around the built environment and autism. Um, it was a great study that was done and actually done with students. And they took photos of the, the environment that they were studying in and the impact on them. So it's quite a powerful piece to really understand the, the built environment, how it in, can, can impact um, the students on the, with near diversity. Um, also, I've posted the information that we have on autism. There's a whole heap of research and um, information that people might find um, useful. Um, so another question is, um, in today's higher education landscape, many um, students experience challenging in forming meaningful connections and building friendships at university. This sense of isolation can persist throughout their entire degree program, significantly impacting their academic journey and overall wellbeing. Neodiverse students in particular may find these challenges exacerbated due to varying social interactions, needs and preferences. Given this context, I'm seeking insights and strategies specifically tailored to support neodiverse students in developing and nurturing friendships. Was there anything that you found in that? I know that we have a number of um, contents around the mentoring programs that exist within some universities, which have proven to be quite successful for students and, and they can be a variety of mentoring with other students on the spectrum or other neodiverse students to, you know, fourth year psychology students. So depending on, on you know, how the different systems, um, yeah, kind of made up. But is there anything from your studies that you could suggest? I think the most meaningful connections that people had at university were with, were with other neurodivergent students. 
Yeah. yeah. So finding people like you who accept you for who you are. Yeah. And and I guess there's mutual support that um, occurred as well where autistic students are helping other autistic students navigate the system. That's great. Um, right. in, in, yeah. Sorry, in addition to that as well, um, a couple of students we interviewed told us that it would have been helpful if um, they have another students in the same course but in a higher year to help guide them through what's expected of of their um, coursework and um, how to navigate assignments and things like that. So it would be great if these people are neurodivergent, but they don't have to be. They just need someone to um, give them a safe space to ask these sort of questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And the challenge with the hidden agenda often within our institutions, it's um, quite frustrating. And also yeah, I struggle with it myself. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And our every academic... staff member I know struggle with navigating a system. So I can imagine how challenging it is for students and especially neurodivergent students. And also just how often we write as academic, you know, as academics, how we write can just be so opposite to what we're trying to be said. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it can be challenging for, for everybody. Um, in the um, analysis of, did you collect anything around the retention of students with neurodiversity in your study? Look, we are challenged by this because of our data set. We um, recently, the government changed the data set, but autism wasn't a part of that. It was under a, you know, a subcategory of, of um, I think, yeah, I can't even remember what it's under now, but it's not, you know, isn't named up of near diversity, worse luck. Mm -hmm. So we actually haven't got the true numbers of students with the autism on, on the spectrum or, um, you know, other near diverse types. So <clears throat> it is hard for us to know that retention, but what did you find in this study? We didn't measure retention. Oh, well. Um, in the table, in the article. Yeah, no. That, talk, that does um, yeah. talk about the number of degrees completed um, and the number of degrees discontinued. Yes. Yeah. So, so many that, students that was in have, the link. Yeah, many students have experienced, um, you know, discontinuing from their studies and then coming back to it and then discontinuing and coming back to it. So mm. um, some of them eventually got a degree, but I can remember at least one of them didn't. And for that one participant who didn't eventually got a, get a degree, um, they were saying how difficult it was to be to have so much educated text there and not to have a degree to show for it. And that is really problematic because we are not we don't have an environment that helps to, to make sure that people su succeed. And then instead we give them a huge uh, a lot of debt that they have to deal mm. with um, post-education. So, um, yeah, we, we, we didn't formally collect that data, but I think, mm. um, yeah, many of them have had experience discontinuing from their studies. And I yeah. think studies from other countries as well have shown that um, retention is poor amongst autistic students. So from looking at the table, um, at the time of our interviews for Participants had not completed their degree. Um, and one, two, three, and eight. Uh, so the number of degrees that were discontinued, um, all but eight had discontinued degree, degrees. Um, and lots of multiple degrees as well. Yep. Yeah. Now, there's a couple of um, big juicy questions come in right at the last minute. <laughs> I'm going to contextualise a couple of them. So one is just, um, is there any clear findings regarding the areas in which students with ASD excel at university? I think people excel in things that they love, just like any anyone else. Um, if you have an interest, um, I mean, it wasn't part of our data, but if you have an interest, um and you know you will do well if you yeah. I this to add to that. no you said it perfectly <laughs> i think this person also goes on to it'd be great to see some research into the unique strengths of their diverse um yeah. students. and mm. and the, the number of degrees was very was very varied as well um yeah yeah so it's not all engineering and computer science no. No. <laughs> um there's a huge range and i think a good proportion came from helping profession 
isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. 45% I worked out at one stage, but also yeah. we had people who might have started doing something that was very science or technology based that then did a different degree in the end, you know, that was a helping profession or the opposite, like, you know, sometimes their first degrees and second degrees were, were vastly different. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a question around, did you measure the level of grit in the students you interviewed and how that, that impacted on the retention and success at university? No, um, so grit was a word used by a participant, which we've mm. used to describe this thing. So yeah. they thought that going through university was really a matter of grit and determination. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that came through the interviews and certainly um, I felt very honoured um, that our participants shared their experiences at university mm. and the challenges that they had. Yeah. Um, this will be the final question, um, and it, it is a big question, so it's it, you know it might be hard to to answer it. But we are in a change, a, you know, a change process within the university sector now with the recent release of the accord. Um, and someone has asked, what systematic change do you think is required to enable um, more to increase the artist the um, autistic enrolments and success within within universities? What else needs? What systemic changes need to be made? investing resources. Um, so I, I agree with um, what you said earlier on, darling, that the University of Court has missed the mark on um, students with disability because um, there is no way that we have done enough for students with disability. So I would say that the systemic change is to put in resources to really support these students. The, the challenge is going to be, I think, at the moment in the accord, yes, there were certainly some challenges around the data and also the language being used, but um, the, 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 there seems to be a strong commitment to needs-based funding. And I think for those that deal with the school sector, know that that isn't the panacea that it's kind of portrayed as. So I think it's really important that the sector continues to stay engaged and continue to, to keep aware of, of, of this space and, and add that will continue to advocate to make sure that yeah, students, including those in their diverse backgrounds, um, you know, are really well represented in, in these conversations to make sure that they continue to succeed um, in tertiary education. So Diana and Marion, thank you so much for your presentation. You can tell by the chat, it's gone off. People loved it. It's absolutely great. Um, just fabulous. It's great to see this research being done and it's great to, to hear your passion and your thought into to how do we can improve things. I hope that this will be an ongoing partnership um, with ADSET. As I said, we're really happy if a guide gets created um, or anything else, we're really happy to promote um, and continue the conversation with you going forward. Um, the lovely team, or Kylie in the background, um, she will post some links to the next webinars we've got coming up. We've got the fabulous Thomas Tobin. If people haven't don't know about Thomas Tobin, um, he's presenting on how to do UDL presentation. I, when he last presented to us, how he did it was just fascinating, even though he didn't tell us. So I asked him to unpack how he presents. So he's going to present to us and um, unpack that, um, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, so that's coming up. And um, I've lost my notes now. And we also have another one coming up on the 23rd of April, which is autistic students and the transition to university. So, which is from our dear friend Alison um, and her PhD. So that's another great one coming up. So hopefully the links are now there. So, and also just please, if you are interested in the UDL symposium, really calling for abstracts that are um, really looking at UDL. So please get some abstracts in and join us in Melbourne or online in June. So thank you to our presenters and thank you everybody for joining us. It's absolutely fabulous to have this conversation. Um, and yeah, well done. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.